Well, good morning and good evening to everyone joining us uh, today. Welcome everyone to the opening panel of the Milken Institute's Asia Summit 2020. As always at this event, it is such a great honor and a privilege to discuss some of the most important and most impactful matters of the world with industry heroes and industry experts. And they don't need any introduction, but I'm gonna give them very short ones anyway. Uh, with us today, we have Jane Sun, who is the CEO of the Trip.com Group. We have Ho Kwang Ping, who is the Executive Chairman of Banyan Tree Holdings. We have Jaime Zobel de Ayala, who's the Chairman and CEO of the Ayala Corporation. And Alfonso Garcia Morda, who is the Vice President Asia Pacific of IFC at the World Bank. So I'm so excited to have our four esteemed guests with us today to discuss the question, will Asia define or be defined by the decade ahead? Now, at this time last year, we would not have even asked this question, but as the session description articulates so well, the global pandemic of 2020 has exposed many of Asia's long extant structural fault lines. And now 11 months into this crisis, it is worthwhile to consider what will be necessary to turn recovery back into growth in our part of the world. Just before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, the World Economic Forum in December of 2019 forecast that in 2020, Asia would have the world's largest GDP, overtaking the GDP of the rest of the world combined. And that by 2030, the region was expected to contribute roughly 60% of all global growth. Now, since the COVID-19 outbreak, new doubts have risen about Asia's immense population and the growing wealth gap that we're starting to see. The interplay and sometimes tension between government and industry innovation, the sustainability of our cities as, an, as, as, uh, as economic growth has driven the cities to change and the long-term impact of geopolitical struggles on the globalization that is so critical to this region of the world. So our goal over the next 40 minutes, which is not a lot of time, is to try and touch on each of these topics and hopefully challenge the assumptions and elevate the under understanding of our audiences around the world. So let's dive right in and start with the population. <laughs> Asia will be responsible for the overwhelming majority, about 90%, of the 2 billion new members entering into the middle class, the global economy over the course of the next decade. Much has been made of Asia's middle class driving change around the world, not just in the region, especially considering how young they are. And their influence will only grow with time. In 2030, as an example, two in every three members of the middle class around the world will likely be from Asia. So how will this massive population shift impact the next decade? We're gonna take a look at just one industry as an example. And that industry, of course, with our guests here is travel. The rising influence among the next generation of Asia Pacific consumers is actually estimated to add nearly 90 million new travelers by 2025. And while the path for recovery in the travel and tourism industry will vary market by market after the pandemic, we have to start with China because China's distinct experience may hold many, many lessons and insights for the travel industry, not only in Asia, but around the world. So Jane, I must come to you first. You have remained very optimistic about the future of travel and predicted that domestic travel in China would recover extremely quickly. Now, 10 months in, I think your prediction seems to be very, very much on point. So if I can ask you to start us off, what lessons can you share about how COVID initially impacted leisure travel in China? And now how has China recovered? What is the state of domestic travel in China at this moment? Sure, thanks for having me. China is the first country which got hit by COVID-19. Uh, in, uh, in January, the country was uh, uh, fighting against the COVID uh, in a very dark uh, stage. Uh, however, the government took very decisive measures to lock down Wuhan and contain the outbreak of the virus. Uh, so fortunately, the measures worked. Now the country is clean up. We have seen in Q3, uh, GDP growth rate for China has rised to 4%. 
four percent plus positive uh, GDP growth, which is the first country uh, which pulled out uh, from the negative zoom. And in travel, Q1, Q2 was very difficult for us. Uh, we launched 2 billion natural disaster relief fund for the customers to help them with the change and cancellation of their trip. 1 billion with the partnership fund to inject cash into the uh, ecosystem. Uh, now in Q3 with the Golden Week holiday, we saw pretty much a recovery uh, in all business line. And some of the business line already show a positive growth on a year over year basis. For example, rental car, uh, air tickets, hotel, uh, et cetera. Uh, we, this morning, we just delivered our Q3 number and made 1.6 billion bottom line, which is the first time this year uh, turned uh, from a lost position into a profitable position. So overall, because of the effective control measures in China, uh, we are confident uh, going forward uh, that domestic travel will recover very nicely. And that also brings the hope for all the major multinationals which has branches in China. For example, I was on a call uh, with all the hotel CEOs. Uh, their uh, business in China start to boom. Uh, ADR is increasing, occupancy rate is increasing. Uh, so uh, that brings hope uh, for the rest of the world that eventually uh, once the uh, by, uh, vaccine is effective, uh, we'll be able to uh, lead the recovery uh, for the travel industry globally. Kwamping, that, that must be music to your ears. Uh, you, of course, have discussed previously that there are major advantages to being a large single market like China and the U.S. because travel recovery can rely on the substantial domestic market. But across Southeast Asia, uh, there are many smaller economies that have world-famous tourist destinations, uh, which often the entire economy relies on, uh, like Thailand as an example, but because their domestic markets are just not large enough to sustain their industries when borders are closed, the crisis is getting ever deeper. So from your point of view, even after hearing what Jane has said, and I'm sure that the banyan trees in China are experiencing this resurgence as well, what do you think about the future of Southeast Asia travel? Is it uh, going to recover over the course of the next couple of years? How dependent is it uh, on our borders, regional borders opening again? Well, what, you, what Jane just said was music to one ear, but not music to the other because all our hotels in China are doing extremely well, but I wish China would open up its borders to allow Chinese tourists to visit other parts of the world, which unfortunately China is not doing. But you know, all crises basically just accelerate existing trends, whether they're positive trends like digitalization or negative trends like increasing social inequality. And in the case of hospitality in Asia, um, one of the incipient trends, which I think uh, would have been maybe 10 years in the making from now, but was accelerated by the pandemic, is the rise of domestic tourism within the ASEAN countries. You saw this already happening, what I call the Air Asia phenomenon, some 10 over years ago, when people started traveling within ASEAN itself, and it's picking up speed. But the pandemic, the one, the few positive things about this pandemic is, is that it really has made everyone in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, from the Philippines to Indonesia to Thailand, realize that they have to rely more on the domestic tourism. And that's extremely positive because 